my audio. Could somebody just make a comment to see if my voice sound is coming through pretty good and clearly? Uh, uh, just checking for a confirmation that the live broadcast is is functioning. I'm just going to test something here. Oh, great, great. OK, nice to hear. OK, uh, so we will jump into this. So uh, as I alluded to in the title and everything, uh, the goal for this presentation here is to really dive deep into motor efficiency and everything regarding motor and system efficiency when it comes to e-bikes. Uh, this is a topic I've long wanted to, uh, that I've long been super curious and fascinated about myself. And I've spent a good amount of my life trying to optimize um, and uh, and improve the efficiency of e-bike systems. And a lot of that comes from having a background as an engineer and it becomes sort of one of your instinctive drives. Um, glad to hear that the microphone is sounding better too. Uh, I realized last time, in spite of me having the headset, uh, it was my uh, webcam microphone that was actually the one that was being fed to the stream. Um, so yeah, so this presentation is going to be Again, fairly technical, more of a follow up on the first talk that I gave uh, than the second one. But I'm going to start off with some more high level discussions uh, because we find uh, one of the things that I see uh, being involved in the business and the pre sale support with e bikes is uh, well, a lot of people don't care about efficiency much at all. Some people way over obsess about it, um, and sometimes for all the wrong reasons. So, um, the very first thing that I want to um, get at in here is uh, is at a big picture when you're choosing or setting up an e-bike system, what are the things that matters, right? And it's super important that the e-bike drive that you get has a sufficient power for what you need in your application. So whether depending on the great hills that you're climbing, the kind of cargo that you need, just how big and heavy you are as a rider, uh, whether you're just looking for a modest lightweight amount of assistance, if you really need to tow children and you have a you know injured knee and can't pedal hard, um, that's of super paramount importance. Uh, what else is important in choosing an e-bike? Does it have the range that you need? So, you know, it's kind of pointless to get an e-bike that will have a battery that dies out after 30 kilometers if your round trip commute is 40 kilometers. Um, you don't want to have to stop up and charge up during the day all the times to complete your trip. Uh, so range is a really important criteria when you're selecting parts for an e-bike. Um, and of course, is it within the weight in your price budget? So some people have requirements that the whole conversion isn't too heavy. Um, so if it's a bike that you need to carry with you on transit or carry it up a flight of stairs, you may make some sacrifices for power and range in order to have a weight that you want. And of course, a lot of people uh, approach their selection of e-bikes with a specific budget or budget target in mind. And there's no point if the dream bike you want costs $10,000 and you've only allocated $2,000 um, that uh, that budget consideration comes into the picture. Um, so where does efficiency fit in all of this equation? And the answer is that motor efficiency in and of itself <laughs> doesn't really enter the equation. If you have a bike that achieves the power that you want, that covers the range that you need and what's in your weight and your price objectives, that's perfect. You don't really care if the motor is able to run at 83% efficient or if it just peaks at 79% or if it's got an amazing 90%. That is not something you as a rider ever experience, ever see, and ever really directly witness while you're riding the bike. Um, and uh, But efficiency does come into play indirectly in that it does have consequences to these things. So for instance, if a motor is not very efficient the way that you're using it, it might not be able to sustain the power output that you require because at a lower efficiency, it's going to be generating more heat to put the same output power and that's going to make it overheat faster or overheat under less loads. Um, if it is less efficient, it might have a little bit less range than you might otherwise get for the same battery pack in a more efficient setup. Now, this range concern is really kind of a, a second order one because the, the difference is in efficiency. You might be talking 5%, 8%. Um, and usually you budget a battery that has, you know, 20, 40, 50, 100% more range than you actually require. 
Um, and so the effect of efficiency on range is often overstated. It does play a little role, but it's not a significant one in the, uh, in the selection criteria. Um, and then uh, really highly efficient systems may end up weighing more and being more expensive than a less, a less efficient setup that may do uh, the same thing. So efficiency isn't a number that you as an e-bike builder, a DIYer, just a regular consumer should be obsessed about. Um, you should be obsessed about these three things at the top. Um, and I'll even go so far as to say that designing for optimal efficiency is uh, more often than not a foolish objective. Um, and this sort of, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's hard to hear for a lot of people who come up out, who have, you know, an engineering background or are very um, obsessed about optimizations throughout systems. And we see, and I, I deal with this quite often, where we have customers who just spend hours and hours exploring all the different motors on our simulator, trying to figure out just which is the best hub or which is the best combination of parts for what they're trying to do. And we provide all these tools uh, specifically to enable people to quantitatively assess those things. But if you're doing that under a pursuit of optimal efficiency, you'll often go totally down the wrong path. And I'll show just a concrete example of what this can look like. Um, so just as a hypothetical, consider somebody uh, whose goal is to have just a lightweight e-bike, uh, maybe something that they uh, have on their boat with them. So they hop off at the harbor and then they just have a short trips to do around the town. Um, so they think, okay, I don't need very much battery pack. At most, you know, 200 watt hours will be fine. I typically never go more than 10, 15 kilometers. This might, another example, be somebody who brings a bike with them uh, in their RV when they're driving across doing road trips and then they can park, you know, at a campground and just go for little errands on their bike. Uh, they're not after a big battery pack and they don't need much range and they want it to be a fairly lightweight bike that you can carry around. Um, so they might have assumed, assessed based on those range names that they're fine with just a small 200 watt hour battery, uh, which if that's coming from us, there would be two of our little LIGO modules. And they might have researched, you know, lightweight, efficient motors, and you might find, you know, our Grinnell axle direct drive motors. This is a motor that I'm quite happy about the performance spec on it. It has really good efficiency. It can do regenerative braking. Uh, for a direct drive hub, it's relatively lightweight at 3.9 kilograms. Um, and another option might be a small geared motor. So here I'm using this example, the Bafang G311. And this geared motor is quite a bit lighter. It's 2.3 kilos, but it has worse efficiency and it can't do regenerative braking. So on a pursuit purely on efficiency metrics, here's how these two systems would compare. So somebody might enter you know, an apples to apples comparison, the same battery pack, the same motor controller, um, here, I've actually tweaked the RPM per volt of the Bafang motor just so that the simulator curves are matching um, uh, to the same top unloaded speed too. And you can see in this plot that the, the direct drive Grenall axle motor has 86% system efficiency um, at this cruising speed of 31 kilometers an hour, um, whereas the small geared motor only ever peaks at about 81%. And at this cruising speed, um, it's only going to be 80% efficient. So that extra 80%, uh, extra 6% motor efficiency means that with the same setup here, with these two LIGO batteries, this direct drive motor is going to give two kilometers more range before the battery runs out. Um, not that the range is crazy. It's a difference between, you know, 26 kilometers and 24 kilometers. Um, but uh, you might think, great, I made the right choice. So now I'm able to eke out a little bit more distance. Um, with my super efficient direct drive motor over this geared motor with the additional losses that are inside it. Um, and if you step back for a picture for a second and just look at the big picture of what you've put together now, um, the system running this 86% direct drive motor, if you add up the cost of the motor uh, and the weight of all these components, we wind up with a kit that's over $1,000 and just about five and a half kilograms. Um, and if we looked at the Bafang system, it's not as efficient, um, but it comes in at substantially less cost, $660, and substantially less weight, 3.7 kilos. And then you ask yourself, well, since I'm, you know, what am I, $400 below budget and uh, one, one and a half kilos less weight, well, why don't I use that money savings and weight savings and just buy another battery? So we could take this geared motor kit, add another LIGO battery here to make this three LIGO packs, 
Um, and now with three LIGO batteries, I'm still going to be less expensive. I'm still going to be less weight. So one more LIGO is going to bring this up to 4.3 kilos. And with three of those batteries, my range is going to be substantially farther than two batteries with the more efficient motor. And in this case, with the, the, the price difference and weight difference, you could even afford to put two more LIGOs. So effectively double the battery capacity, have an overall setup now that's still lighter, that's still less expensive, um, and that has close to double the range, even though the peak efficiency is lower. So is efficiency what you should be optimizing and choosing an e-bike setup? No, the whole big picture is what matters here. And, uh, and if this smaller motor is more than adequate for what your requirements are, and if your requirement was mostly riding around flap grounds, doing errands around uh, uh, campgrounds or something, um, this is certainly a more appropriate and optimized setup in spite of the lower efficiency. Um, and I'll do another example. And in this case here, I'm not gonna compare two different systems. I'm gonna see what happens if you optimize your usage of the bike to get maximum efficiency. So this question comes up all the time too. And people ask us, you know, how do I optimally use the bike to get the most efficiency from it? We hear a lot of people say, oh, you know, never use the throttle from the start, always pedal to get up to speed and then only use the motor once you're moving because the motors are really not that efficient at low speeds. And then you waste a bunch of energy accelerating. Um, and, uh, um, and there's, uh, yeah, a lot of ideas that people have in their head often founded in uh, Salomon of, tr of truth that affects how they choose to ride their bike, how they choose to use the power in an effort to squeeze out the most efficiency from the motor of their system. Um, so here's this, uh, an approach that comes up fairly often. So uh, we know that, and if you've seen my, the previous presentations, or if you spent any time with <laughs> working with electric motors, that in general, motors are more efficient the higher the RPM that you run them at. Um, so if you're encountering a hill, based on this knowledge of higher efficiency at higher speeds, you might think, oh, well, I should really climb this hill as fast as possible so I have the best motor efficiency. And you might go to our simulator and simulate climbing hills at different speeds and see that completely validated. So on the left here, I've run a simulation. Uh, here we've got the all-axle motor um, climbing up a, what is it? It's a 6% uh, grade hill. Um, and if I just ride this at full throttle, um, the system, you know, predicts me climbing up the hill at 34 kilometers an hour and my motor efficiency, which you see up here is basically 77%. Um, so not fabulous, but not terrible either. So we get a 77% efficiency climbing this hill at full throttle. And then if you were to run the same simulation, um, and now go up the heat speed slower. So what might be a more typical hill climbing speed for a cyclist up a 6% grade is probably more like 10 kilometers an hour. So you'll go faster than that. Here I've just run a simulation at 15 kilometers an hour. Um, so that happened by setting my throttle in this case to 42%. Um, so at 15 kilometers an hour climbing this 6% hill, um, my efficiency is worth. It's motor efficiency is only 73%. Um, so your uh, conclusion that climbing the hill, going up the hill faster will be more efficient uh, use of the motor or will run the motor better efficiency is true. Um, but if you were to conclude then that you should zip up every hill at full throttle uh, in order to maximize your motor efficiency, well, you might be a bit surprised when you look at the actual numbers at the top of your climb. So here I'm assuming this same 6% grade hill climb. Um, and I'm assuming during this simulation um, that the rider is putting out 150 watts, and that's sort of a modest amount of pedal effort that you might put on an e-bike when you're climbing a hill. Um, so climbing this hill at full throttle, and even though it has 77% motor efficiency, I ended up consuming 60 watt hours from the battery pack. Um, the temperature of the motor reached 45 degrees at the top of this hill. So I'm, I'm pretending that I'm climbing that hill, uh, that 6% that, that hill is a two kilometer line climb. Um, and I've wasted, um, you know, over 11 watt hours uh, of, to heating the motor. So that much of my battery watt hours, 11.4 of that went into just generating heat inside the hub. Um, and I wasted almost 20 watt hours to air resistance. So as I was ripping up this hill at 34 kilometers an hour, I lost 20, almost 20 watt hours just to air turbulence caused by going at that speed. Um, and while I was riding up at 30 kilometers an hour with my legs at 150 watts, I was able to contribute kind of a mere 8.7 watt hours to the F1 
So you can see that from the battery, I use 60 watt hours. My legs were only able to contribute 8.7. So 80 plus percent of the energy used is coming from the battery in this situation. Um, that same 6% climb uh, throttled back and done at 15 kilometers an hour only used 28 watt hours from the battery pack. So less than half the energy uh, in order to do the climb. The motor at the top of the climb isn't as hot. It's only 32 degrees Celsius instead of 45. Um, that's because during the slower climb, only 5.8, just under six watt hours of heat was generated inside the hub between the copper and the core losses. And you notice I wasted way less energy to air turbulence, only three and a half watt hours, almost a negligible, negligible amount uh, compared to the energy gained from climbing a hill, the gravitational energy that uh, uh, went into that climb. And because I was climbing the hill more slowly, a larger percentage of the required energy came from my legs. In this case, just about 20 watt hours instead of less than nine amp hours. Um, so it's true that climbing that hill fast uh, enabled the motor to run at a better efficiency, um, but it also used twice the battery energy, resulted in a higher motor temperature and wasted more power to external effects, to heating the motor and to air turbulence. So again, pursuing a climb, if your goal of the climb is to do it with the motor running as efficient as possible, sure, climb it fast. Um, but if your goal is to climb the hill and use the least amount of your battery pack, well, <laughs> that was not the, the optimal strategy. You should actually go more slowly so that you have less uh, wasted uh, energy going into air turbulence and so that your legs can contribute a larger share. Um, and if again, your goal is to climb the hill and not have the motor be too hot at the top of the climb, uh, in this example, again, uh, running the motor less efficiently, but at a lower power level uh, is still a less total final temperature. So, um, so I've used both of these examples that just the pure pursuit of efficiency um, for efficiency's sake, in almost all cases for an average e-bike rider, isn't what you should be striving for or aiming for. Um, so the question then is why have a whole talk about efficiency? Um, and uh, somehow, hold on, is it? So I was just figuring, playing with, uh, there we go. <laughs> um, so there are a few cases where um, efficiency really is important. And these are cases where you are building an electric vehicle of some kind where you're fundamentally limited in how much energy you have available. So this would be the case, for instance, if you're in a you know, solar electric car race where you're just sitting in a vehicle with no human power um, and all of your energy has to be collected from solar panels, you really wanna make sure that every available watt hour that you have coming in is able to go into useful mechanical power to the motor. Um, there's another event, uh, the electrothons, where people are given, you know, a finite size battery pack. And then you have to do these endurance races or distance races, who can get the furthest or last the longest for a given size battery. So then again, you have a fixed amount of energy available. You want to make the most of all of that. Uh, in almost all regular e-bike or EV users, energy is abundant and cheap. I mean, the cost you know, when you, the fact that the cost factor of electricity and your ownership of riding an e-bike, it just doesn't enter the equation. Um, and e-bikes use so little energy compared to all other modes of electric transport that it really matters not at all if an extra 5.5 watt hours went into a less efficient motor in terms of uh, how much power we use from the grid and what our, our total footprint is uh, riding electric vehicles, or electric bikes specifically. Um, and... Uh, but mostly the reason why I want to have this talk is because there is a, a lot of misunderstanding about motor efficiency. Um, and part of it I feel slightly responsible for because we've made these tools that plot motor efficiency um, and people look at that with a bit of a narrow vision um, and come to erroneous conclusions about it. Um, and then there's the fact that uh, like uh, many people who suffer my predicament of having an engineering background, it's one of those things that we obsess about. I can't help, you know, when I'm you know, building shelves or a cabinet of taking advantage of every possible piece of real estate so that we don't have space wasted um, with, you know, extra gaps between the rails or sides. I really feel like I want to maximize everything I do. Um, and when it comes to setting up e-bike systems, there's also a bit of an obsession about trying to get the most, the most out of your input. Um, and I do want to show how to uh, accurately and correctly answer questions regarding motor efficiency uh, with the simulator tools that we have here. Uh, so I'm just gonna start off with a plot, uh, the typical you know, output curve that you'd see from our motor simulator, which is 
completely correct. And it, this matches what you test when you measure motor with the dyno on the bench. Uh, and you get this curve where you see, you know, the blue here is the torque of the motor. Uh, the red is the power output. Um, this, you know, inflection point here is where the motor controller is battery current limited. Over here, the motor controller is not limited by anything. We're limited by the voltage of the battery pack. And this green plot here is this famous efficiency curve. And a lot of people will do, run a simulation on a motor. They'll see this plot and they'll say, oh, cool. Now I, like, I understand graphs. You know, I know what watts are efficiency. And this is telling me that this motor has a peak efficiency at 46 kilometers an hour. Um, and there's kind of a sweet spot between 40 to 47 where the efficiency is you know, pretty good, over 82%. And that's probably where we want to run this bike. So with this motor, it should really be always run, you know, between 40 to 47 kilometers an hour. And EGADs, if you're running the motor at low speeds, look at how terrible this is. You know, 15 kilometers an hour, I'm over at 55% efficiency. You know, even 20 kilometers an hour, the motor is only 65% efficient. Stay away from those zones. And this uh, conclusion is what leads a lot of people to, for instance, avoid throttling from a standstill or accelerating from a dead stop and waiting until they've sort of pedaled up to speed before they engage the motor, um, <laughs> which totally undermines the main purpose of having an e-bike, which is to facilitate your riding of the bike, make it easier to get up to speed. Um, and it's also a completely erroneous conclusion uh, because the nature of this curve is uh, a full throttle output curve. And if you're comparing the performance at different speeds, if you look at this blue plot, the blue plot here is the torque output of the motor. And at our nice little sweet spot, the motor is only running at less, you know, somewhere between 15 to 20 Newton meters of torque. So a pretty modest amount of torque output from the motor. You can't compare the efficiency at 15 to 20 Newton meters with the efficiency when you're running, say, 15 kilometers an hour at full throttle and you're generating 80 Newton meters of torque that's way more taxing from the motor, causing way more internal heat losses than the 20 Newton meters that you're making over here. Um, and so it's, this plot is not a fair way to look at the efficiency of the motor over speed. It's looking at the output power at full throttle. And if your speed was to slow down at full throttle, the motor would be generating way, way more power than it is at this higher speed. And it would quickly accelerate you to the speed. So this is a true plot. If you go full throttle from a dead standstill, you're going to rapidly accelerate. 95 Newton meters of torque is, you know, almost, you know, skid out, burn rubber kind of torque levels. Um, and then you'll just rocket yourself up to your cruising speed of 46 kilometers an hour or whatever. Um, and during that acceleration, yeah, your efficiency is not going to be great. That's not how people use an e-bike. Um, and when you're cruising at lower speeds, you're not needing... 60, 75 Newton meters in order to sustain a lower speed. In fact, as your speed goes down, the required torque on the motor goes down as well. Um, and to move a bike at low speeds on flat ground actually needs very, very little torque output. So I should really emphasize um, how little torque is needed for low speed travel on a bike uh, on level ground. And we'll see that in some of the upcoming curves. Um, so so yeah, so this conclusion, sorry, I should have meant to do this here. So that, that, that's what I was just getting at, that a lot of people have this idea that there's a sweet spot, a, or a peak efficiency zone, that's where you want to operate the motor. Everything else is kind of bad news or, or only be there for short times. Um, and uh, so here what I'll do is uh, I'm showing exactly the same motor, same battery, same controller, same everything, but I simply run that e-bike now at 50% throttle level. Um, so instead of me running at full throttle, I'm 50% throttle. Now, this sweet spot is in the 21 to 24 kilometer hour zone. So here we're now seeing an efficiency. If you look at the efficiency here, it's still over 80%. Um, so in this previous graph at 20 kilometers an hour, we were seeing only 65% efficiencies. But the actual efficiency at the torque output that you need to sustain in the 22 kilometers an hour range is quite good. It's over 80%. Um, and so the efficiency curve of a motor is not a fixed curve of a motor. It ma it's, a, it's a function of how you choose to plot it. And in this case, we're plotting the motor at constant voltage. So we're, we're varying the RPM of the motor when the voltage we have going to the motor is fixed. And the voltage going to the motor 
is the battery voltage, the battery voltage times the throttle setting. So this here is the same curve you'd get if we were to run this motor at 24 volts and 100% throttle. Because 50% throttle is just cutting our voltage by half uh, with a voltage-based motor controller. Um, so the curve that we would want to see, um, at, or yeah, so to, to show a different perspective on a motor efficiency curve, instead of us plotting motor efficiency um, at constant motor voltage, where the torque output is much, much higher at low speed and much, much lower at high speeds, uh, we can use our simulator to make a plot to show the efficiency at a constant torque. And so here you can see my torque in this simulation is hovering around 10 newton meters, uh, starts off a tiny bit higher, ends a tiny bit lower. Um, uh, the, uh, the reason for that is because the core loss is increased with wheel speed. Um, but to make a simulator curve like this, again, it's exactly the same motor in the previous ones. Um, when you choose the motor controller or make a custom motor controller, when it comes to the throttle type for that motor controller, um, choose a torque throttle. So in the previous simulation, I used a voltage throttle where you know half throttle meant I was giving half the voltage to the motor. So it simulated running the motor at 24 volts. Um, with the torque throttle, the throttle setting that I choose here controls how many amps are flowing to the motor. So in this case, I have a maximum phase current of 90 amps and I'm running at 12% throttle. So 12% of 90 amps is gonna be somewhere around 10 amps of phase current. Um, and so here I'm simulating with 10 amps flowing through the motor at all speeds. And in this simulation, now we have a much fairer view, uh, perspective on the motor efficiency as a function of speed, where we're comparing it with the motor producing the same torque over that speed range. And now instead of these sort of short little zones, you see this you know, sweet spot of high efficiency extends from you know eight kilometers or 10 kilometers an hour all the way up to 50 kilometers an hour so 80 percent of the uh, entire speed range of the the motor here is running at a very high efficiency threat point um, and this is a um you know it's a, it's a, it's again it's another it's exactly the same motor it's a totally accurate uh, simulation curve or, you know, dyno curve. And it's what you get if you run your test at a constant torque on the motor. Um, and it's much more representative of how the motor is, what the motor is exposed to in practice. Um, and so, um, so yeah, this, uh, um, this should, yeah, shed a little bit of light on, uh, on how, how to and how not to interpret an efficiency curve when you see it on a, you know, on a dyno chart or on our simulator. Um, so in practice, the torque to move a vehicle, it's not constant. Um, so this, this simulation here, I just have a constant 10 Newton meters. In reality, the torque needed to move a bike is gonna increase with speed. Um, and so the, the ideal way of making an efficiency map would be to plot it in such a way that you have the torque required to move the vehicle at that specific speed. And this would require us increasing the phase amps over the course of the simulation in order to have just enough torque to overcome the air drag, the rolling drag, and the gravitational drag if you're climbing a hill. Um, so if we go back to the uh, uh, fundamental equation for moving a vehicle, um, the force needed to move any vehicle, whether it's a bike, a car, a skateboard, you name it, um, it's proportional to the weight of the vehicle um, or the, so that's mg, uh, if it's mass in kilograms, which is a gravitational constant, um, times the angle that you're climbing, sine theta. So here, this could also be just effectively the percent grade. Um, and it's proportional to the um, rolling drag of the vehicle. So if you have a given rolling resistance tire, if you have a heavier vehicle, you have more drag. This term here is totally constant. So this force doesn't increase or decrease with speed. It's just a fixed offset of force in the graph, no matter how fast you're going. Um, and then the second term here is the force required to overcome air resistance. Not only is this force not constant with speed, it increases at the square of your velocity. Um, and this would be not, not so much as your road velocity, but the relative speed between you and the wind. So if you have an airspeed blowing at you, um, then this V squared term becomes much more significant. If you have a tailwind, um, then it becomes much less significant. Um, and so this here is your constant um, portion, 
Um, and this here is the one that's proportional to your speed and it's proportional to the speed squared. Um, and if you uh, recall from uh, previous talks and, uh, and from uh, the basic understanding of motors, the power uh, and torque capability of a motor also increases with speed. So if you were to plot what's a motor capable of, the higher the RPM you're on the motor, the more power it can generate and the more torque it can produce. Um, and, uh, and so by and large, that aligns with the force required or the power required to move a vehicle, which also increases with speed. Um, and so because of this fact, electric motors are very well suited to driving a vehicle to propelling it without any, just with a fixed transmission, because as the vehicle moves slower, yeah, a slow spinning motor can't produce as much torque or power, but it also requires less power and torque to move the vehicle at a low speed. So they're really well suited. Um, and ideally we would, again, make an efficiency plot at the torque required to sustain um, uh, a given speed. And unfortunately on our simulator, we can't do this directly yet. So this is, you know, one of the features we may try to um, add into our, our simulator tool where you could do a plot that's automatically adjusting the throttle uh, as a function of speed to exactly match um, the power. But we did add a capability to our motor simulator uh, called simulation sets that let us do a series of simulations in a row and then save the output of that uh, to a, a, a spreadsheet file, a CSV file that you can open in a spreadsheet. Um, and ah, <laughs> my, <laughs> my animated bullets somehow got totally reversed in order. Um, so here uh, I've done that. Um, so I'm using the same motor as I did last time. Um, and I'll show you, let me see if I can switch um, what this simulation set looks like. Um, so if I go back here. Um, so I just got to change my screen share. I'm just trying to find an elegant way of uh, making this happen. Um, so here's a, a bit of a, a pared down version of our motor simulator. Um, so in order to do this kind of simulation uh, where we want to find, uh, we want to look at the efficiency at exactly the point where the power of the motor matches the power to move the vehicle, which is this black line, um, we can run the simulation set. And all we're doing is we're varying the throttle from a very low throttle to full throttle. So here I'm doing that in 96 steps. So I'm just gonna get from five, six, seven, up to 100% throttle levels. Um, and then you can see the simulation take place. Um, and now the throttle's scaling up and we can see the efficiency of the motor when it's exactly matched and the output to move the vehicle at that speed. And you can see that it's hovering near that peak efficiency over the entire speed range. Um, and then in the output, you get a bunch of data like this. Um, you can copy that data to the clipboard and then you would just paste it in Excel or um, whatever your favorite spreadsheet is or write a Python script to do the analysis and make plots. Um, and when we do that, we can now plot the efficiency versus the vehicle speed um, at, at this point of, of, of steady state where, where the motor power matches the load power. Um, so I'm just gonna remove this add okay um so here's what it looks like when i do that analysis and so here i've plotted uh, this big crystallite crown motor um at a zero percent grade so this is on level ground um and this here is the plot that really really represents what's the efficiency of this e-bike uh, as a function of how fast you're going. Um, so the blue line here is the torque uh, required to move the bike uh, at this speed on level ground. And then this green plot now is the efficiency of the motor when it's providing that torque at this speed. And so you can see that um, at really low speeds, the motor efficiency is not all that great. So 10 kilometers an hour, we're kind of 65% efficient. Um, and that's because uh, with this big motor, the torque required is so low that the motor, just the drag of the motor is dominating the losses. Um, and it's not until we're going faster 
that we can have the motor producing an output torque that's substantially more than the internal drag torque from, from hysteresis and eddy current core losses. Um, if we do that same curve, and, and uh, <laughs> Sultry is right on this, um, if we now run this simulation on um, up a 2% grade, um, now, if you look at this same simulation where we've set a grade, a 2% hill climb, the power at, or the torque required at low speeds is not negligible. It's not 10 Newton meters. Um, and that's because when you're climbing a hill, going up an incline, there's a steady torque requirement just to overcome gravity that you saw in that first equation that's totally independent of the speed. So it's like this whole torque graph is now shifted up by about 10 Newton meters um, because that's how much torque is needed to overcome gravity. And now as we go faster and faster, now we start seeing additional torque needed to go overcome the air resistance. And here we see a higher overall efficiency uh, because the motor is generating more output torque. And so the ratio of output torque to the, uh, the drag torque of the motor is better than it was. Um, and then you can continue that process. So here I have it up a 5% grade hill. Um, and here we have it up a 10% grade hill. Um, and the curves, they don't look super different. Um, what I did in this last graph here is I just superimposed all of them. Um, so this here gives a really good graphical picture of this e-bike setup. Um, and so you can see the motor efficiencies are all in these green plots here. Um, and these are at uh, the different grades. And you can see from these plots, the highest overall efficiency uh, happens for this particular motor when we're climbing up a 2% hill. Um, and here we're, you know, over 70% efficient, even at eight, eight, uh, oh, shoot. Is somebody saying that my mic, can, can people confirm that my mic is still running fine? I've just noticed the, oh, never mind. That's from way back. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, uh, I'm just catching up on the, um, the posts here. Um, so, um, so yeah, so this, uh, in here, you can see the torque at different grades. So this is at 0%, this is at a 2% hill, this is a 5% hill, and here is climbing up a 10% hill. And then this is the associated motor efficiency for each of those climbs as a function of the speed that you choose to climb the hill at. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we can see that the, the actual highest efficiency is not riding on flat ground. It's actually going uphill uh, because this is a big and powerful motor and the, the power needed to move at on the flats is less than what the motor can do, um, do efficiently. Um, and then you see when we go up to this 10% climb, now we're dealing with you know 35 Newton meters of torque and you can see the overall efficiency um, on a 10% uh, hill climb is definitely worse than the, the gentler climbs um, because now we're really taxing the motor. We have a la large amount of uh, copper losses, of I squared R losses because of the amount of current we need through the motor in order to generate 35 Newton meters of torque. Um, so that's the graph that really we want to be showing if you when it, when it comes to appreciating a uh, system efficiency for an e-bike with a hub motor. Um, and one, one thing you'll notice here is that the, you want to ask, well, what's the peak efficiency? And this efficiency keeps on climbing as we're going faster and faster. Um, so I was kind of curious too, because I would have thought, you know, at some point you're going to be running the motor at such high power levels that the efficiency um, must start to decrease again, that the core, copper losses are going to be so crazy um, and the core losses are going to be crazy too. And there, there must be some kind of peak maximum efficiency where going faster um, uh, is less efficient. Um, and uh, so I, I ran the simulation using a, you know, 100 or 150 volt battery pack. Um, and then you can see, yeah, sure enough, there is some value somewhere around 45 kilometers an hour or so where the efficiency is at a maximum. Um, but it's still amazingly efficient going all the way up to 100 kilometers an hour. Um, but running 100 kilometers an hour, the motor, you know, a bicycle is incredibly non-aerodynamic. And uh, and this is a, a surprising fact is that <laughs> there's actually more air drag to move a bike at 100 kilometers an hour than a compact and well, well, uh, well streamlined car at 100 kilometers an hour. Um, so to move this bike at 100 kilometers an hour, generating 110 Newton meters of torque, 
um, at this kind of RPM is about 10,000 watts of power. Um, so here we have a motor generating 10 kilowatts of power. This is a, a crystallite motor, um, and it would overheat in uh, not seconds, but you know, a minute or two. Um, so here I've, I have a plot here where I included the predicted steady state motor temperature. Um, so even though you can say, hey, this is great, I'm 80% efficient, I'm over 80% efficient, you know, ripping along at 80 kilometers an hour with this hub motor. Um, even though the efficiency is good, it's so much power that it's still tons and tons of heat that's being dissipated. And 80% efficiency at 10,000 watts still means 2,000 watts of heat that we need to shed out of the motor. And there's no way that these motors, even if you add oil fill or cooling modifications, can shed 2,000 watts uh, without the motor, uh, the internal temperature exceeding uh, what the motor can handle and it overheating and cooking. Um, so this plot of, of temperature of final steady state motor core temperature just goes through the roof um, at these things, even though the motor efficiency is good. So another case where just looking at the efficiency and isolation isn't a really good metric for whether you're running the motor in a healthy zone. Here, the motor efficiency might only be 70%, but it's only going to get 27 degrees Celsius riding the bike here. Here, the motor efficiency is higher, but it's absolutely going to get cooked if you try to sustain that for any length of time. Um, so, um, yeah, so, um, so what I'm going to go into for the next little section is uh, going to dive in on a more technical basis, and I'm going to have some equations in here. I actually thought I was going to do uh, more equation analysis, uh, and instead I'm not. I'll leave these, uh, I'll go over, over these points here, but it, what I wanted to now go at is where is motor efficiency coming from, um, and, you know, we all know that efficiency of a system is the output power versus the input power. So if you're getting 750 watts out of a motor and you're putting 1,000 watts into it or into the motor controller, we're going to have 75% efficiency. Um, but why would we only get 750 watts out of a motor when we put in 1,000 watts? It's because for the power that we put into a motor, a lot of it goes into generating mechanical output power, but a good chunk of it is lost to heating the copper windings from current flowing through the copper and from heating the iron, the stator of the motor, um, as a result of changing magnetic fields. Um, so there are other you know, secondary or tertiary losses that can take place in these systems, but the three fundamental ones account for the vast majority of it, and it's all you really need to have a, a full picture understanding of motor efficiency. So the copper loss in a system is I squared R. So if you double the torque through a motor, um, the, the, torque of, the torque of a motor is directly proportional to the current. So if you wanted a given torque, you need a given amps. If you need double the torque, it's double the amps. The amount that you heat the motor as a result of that torque increases four times if you double the torque because it's twice the current. Um, and then the other losses are core losses. Um, and this I covered in the, in the first presentation. You have hysteresis loss um, and that power loss to hysteresis, this is the changing magnetic field, um, is uh, just some constant, so I, I just call it A naught for the sake of my own equation writing, times the omega is the, the speed that the motor is spinning at. Um, and then you have eddy current losses, which is from currents that are induced, and that increases, the power of that increases at the RPM of the motor squared. Um, so, um, so here I'm just going to talk a little bit about copper loss. Um, so copper loss is totally inevitable. So unless you build a motor with superconductors, um, then whenever you have torque, you're, when you're having the motor generate torque, you have current flowing through the windings. And current flowing through any wire generates heat. Uh, the amount of heat that it generates is I squared R uh, from Ohm's law. Um, and as I said, it's if you want to get more torque out of the motor, that means more current, and your losses as a result of that current increase quadratically with your torque output. Um, so, um, so if you want to minimize your copper losses, well, one way is let's have less torque of the motor. So if you cut your amps in half, the motor generates half as much torque, but your copper losses are a quarter what they are. Um, but that also means we're getting less power out of the motor. And part of the point of a motor is to generate power. So uh, the goals of having using the motor to make power is totally at odds with having the motor waste as little heat as possible. And so there's some trade-off point in there. Um, 
one thing that's really important to understand is that changing the speed of the motor. So if you have a motor with a faster KV or a slower KV, um, the KV is directly uh, inversely proportional to the KT, the relationship between torque and motor amps. If you have a motor that's wound for a lower speed, so it generates more torque per amp, you might think, hey, now we can get the same torque, but with fewer amps, because this term here, the KT is higher, uh, because we get a higher Newton meter per amp constant. Um, but that is wishful thinking, because in order to wind the motor for more torque per amp, we need more turns of copper. More turns of copper means, of course, more resistance in the wire, because the, the total length of the wire is longer, and the wire is smaller in diameter, because to fit more turns around the slot, you have to use thinner gauge of fewer strands in parallel. And those two things completely cancel each other out. So even though you can use less amps for the same torque with a slower motor, you have a higher winding resistance. And if you have set it up so you can need half as many amps to achieve the same torque, your winding resistance increases by a factor of four, so the I squared R remains the same. Uh, so the only way that you can really reduce the copper loss uh, um, is to increase the amount of copper fill. So that would mean somehow packing more copper wire inside that slot, or you know, if you can use uh, square or flat copper sheet instead of round copper, there's slightly less gap between the, the openings. Or in the case of if you're actually designing the motor, you have a slot that all the copper is wound in, you could make that slot deeper. And that gives you a larger, vo larger area um, to fill with copper. And then that would allow you to have a thicker, heavier gauge winding, which would have less resistance. Um, and then one important thing to know about the copper loss is that it really gets worse at higher temperatures. So copper um, has a coefficient of resistance. It's about 0.4% per degree. So if your motor increases uh, in temperature by 50 degrees Celsius, um, then the resistance is going to increase by 20%. And that means that the heat generated from the same amount of torque will also increase by 20%. And that can be substantial. Um, and in ca the case of motors, we're often dealing with motors that are up to you know, 120 degrees Celsius. And at that point, that's a 40% higher resistance than we had when the motor was cold. And so the amount of torque that might make you know, 200 watts of heat when the motor's cold is going to be generating 280 watts when the motor is hot. Um, and an extra 80 watts then in turn contributes to, to higher heat inside the motor. Um, so that's copper losses. Um, hysteresis loss is an interesting one. Um, and so the hysteresis loss happens, um, again, at, in, inside the motor, you have this iron stator. And as the motor is rotating, the polarity of the iron is switching. North and south directions flip every time a magnet moves over one of the teeth. Um, and when the, when the alignment flips, the uh, magnetization of the iron follows what's called this hysteresis loop. Um, and for each cycle, every time you go from a north pulse to a south pole, it tracks this hysteresis curve. And the area inside this hysteresis curve represents the amount of energy that has been dissipated, that's been wasted from kind of the internal friction as these magnetic domains switch their alignment. Um, and so if you want to reduce the losses that are coming from hysteresis in the iron core, well, one easy way to do that is to have a lower pole count motor. So instead of having you know a whole bunch of magnets around the rotor and a whole bunch of teeth, you could have fewer magnets and fewer teeth. And then for each revolution of the motor, this cycling of, of polarity happens fewer times. So the typical direct drive motor we deal with now has 23 magnetic pole pairs. So we lose this amount of energy 23 times every single rotation of the motor. If this was like the old bionics motors that had 11 pole pairs, we'd only have half as many cycles. And so we'd gen be generating half the heat um, for each rotation for the same strength of field. Um, you can also reduce the iron losses if you're designing a motor by just reducing the amount of uh, flux, that, sorry, the length of iron that is part of that magnetic flux path so that there's just less volume of iron that's switching polarity. Um, there, you're limited in what you can do there. And that is also at odds with having a deeper slot for more copper fill, because as you make the slot deeper in order to fit more 
um, more copper, then you're also increasing the amount of iron, which increases the amount of energy that gets lost through the cycling. Um, but there are motor designs, for instance, axial flux motors, um, where you have the, I, I wish I had had some sketches here illustrating this, um, but we, you can have a much lower amount of iron in the flux path of the motor um, and a lower volume of iron being cycled the same amount is just less energy again being dissipated. Um, and interestingly, you can also reduce your hysteresis loss by just having weaker magnets. And so you intuitively would think, well, for making the most efficient motor, I should use the strongest possible magnets uh, because a stronger magnet just has to be better, right? You get more torque for the same amount of amperage. Um, but the reason I showed this curve here, uh, this particular example of a hysteresis set um, is so that you can see that if you magnetize the iron, you don't magnetize it as strongly. If you have weaker magnets, the area of this loop can go down quite a bit. So you can see that this middle loop probably has tw less than half the uh, filled area as this outer loop. So for each rotation, each changing polarity, there's half the amount of heat that's being generated. That would mean half the amount of drag torque on the hub. Um, but the consequence of doing that is that you also get less torque for the same amount of amperage flowing through the copper. So now your copper losses are going to be higher in order to achieve a given uh, output torque from the motor. Um, and then you can also improve the hysteresis loss uh, with better grade of uh, steel. So depending on the actual uh, type of iron that's there, and also whether the iron is mechanically grain oriented uh, so that these grains follow the predominant lines of flux, uh, you can then wind up with a curve. Instead of it being wide like this, you might have a hysteresis curve um, that's quite skinny. So a hysteresis curve that's skinny, you know, draw it like this, um, has less area inside. Um, and then for each you know, again, each uh, switching polarity, less energy is lost. And this lets you reduce the hysteresis loss with no trade-offs. All of these other things have trade-offs. So if you have a lower pole count motor, then you need a thicker back iron uh, in order to complete the flux path. So the motor ends up being heavier. Um, and if you have a shorter flux path, that would mean less copper fill in order to have a smaller loop inside the stator. And then weaker magnets means, again, more copper losses to make the same output torque. Um, but if you go to better grade steel, there's no downside. Um, and if you really want to go to the extreme, you could have no steel. You could design an ironless motor. Um, and then you really don't have any hysteresis loss. But you have much, much less torque capability for the same amperage. So you need the motor to spin at a very high RPM to generate adequate power, or you'd need a much larger motor, relatively speaking, um, for the same given torque output. Um, and so the final component of these uh, losses inside the motor is the eddy current losses. And these are the losses that happen from induced circulating currents whenever there's a changing magnetic field. Um, and we all know that the reason why the steel inside the motor is made up of thin sheets stacked together is because when you have a bunch of thin sheets, the current that's induced, so B here is the direction of the magnetic field, where you have a changing field when the motor's rotating. Um, if you have one giant loop that the current can flow in, um, you get a very large uh, amount of flux um, inside that loop, and that causes a very high induced voltage, which means very large currents that circulate inside the steel. And by breaking that up into thinner sections, each little conductive loop now has a much smaller area. So there's a smaller um, uh, amount of changing of, of flux in that current path. Um, and then that results in a lower, a much lower amount of current flowing. Um, so if eddy current losses are significant, then uh, again, we can reduce these losses with a lower pole motor because that again results in a more slowly changing magnetic field. So the slower the magnetic field changes, the less dramatic the induced currents are. Um, and thinner laminations is the main approach that's used in order to reduce these losses. And as you get motors spinning at higher and higher RPMs, the, desire, the requirement for those thinner laminations becomes more and more important. Um, as with eddy current losses, or as with hysteresis losses, a weaker magnetic field will have less losses here. Um, and in addition to these losses being present in the steel of the motor, um, you also have induced currents in the copper of the motor. So the copper that's used to wind the motor 
is also subject to these changing magnetic fields. And inside that copper, you have current that you're forcing through the motor in order to make torque. But then you have these circulating currents from induced voltages that cause losses. And those are reduced, just like thin laminations kind of reduce the, um, the size of the circulating path and the amount of the voltage that's causing these loops of current. Similarly, having thinner strands of copper, more small strands in parallel results in less uh, eddy losses in the copper than having a few uh, a few much fatter gauge wires. And the worst would be having one thick gauge wire wrapping the motor pole. Um, and here there's a bit of a, a trade-off between hand wound and machine wound motors. Um, when, uh, when you have machines that are winding the motor, they do much better if it's just one thick gauge wire because that's a lot easier to control with a robot. Um, but if you're trying to wind together, you know, 13 or 15 strands, um, that's quite a bit more difficult to manage with automated equipment. And the sort of hand wound motors are better suited or hand winding is often better suited for uh, doing a high parallel count uh, in the motor wind. Um, so, um, so yeah, and so this uh, is a little, again, a little bit of a recap. Um, one of the nice things about these two parameters of a motor is that even though they seem, um, difficult to, or, you know, it seems like some intrinsic function of the motor that would be hard to actually measure. Um, you can actually measure them very easily by looking at the torque of the motor um, as a function of RPM. So like if you just take the motor and spin it and measure the amount of torque um, that there is on the axle shaft and increase the speed, the torque of the motor at zero RPM, um, this graph doesn't go to 100, but it, it, it should start at zero, where it intersects that line, that is all torque from hysteresis. So you can quantify the amount of hysteresis torque there. Um, and then the slope of this curve, the angle of this line is, um, sorry, I have my mouse in the wrong space. <laughs> um, so where, where this intersects the zero point is the hysteresis torque and the slope of this line, what's this angle? Um, that slope is a direct measure of the eddy current losses. Um, and this is uh, a, a same motor um, that I prepared. This is when I was doing experiments for with lamination thickness and grades of steel, where this motor here, uh, they had exactly the same magnets, um, exactly the same stator design, but this here was with thinner laminations and a better grade steel. And you notice that it has a much gentler slope. The torque increases less with RPM than the thicker lamination. So that's 0.5 millimeters, that's 0.35 millimeters. Um, and these numbers, um, we include them with every motor that we list on our website. So if you click on the specifications tab of any motor um, on our store page, you'll see we talk about the hysteresis torque. So how many Newton meters is lost just flipping the polarity of the iron stator. So this motor is 0.45 Newton meters, and that's a constant torque. It doesn't matter how fast you spin it, the torque from hysteresis is the same. Um, the power increases as the RPM because power is torque times RPM. Um, and then the eddy current loss is here. It's 0 0.005 Newton meters of torque per radian per second. And you can convert this to RPMs by you know doing 60 over two pi to convert radians per second to revolutions per minute to know how many Newton meters of torque, what the contribution of torque is from uh, rotational speed. Okay, um, so now we can plug all of this stuff into this original equation. So um, the efficiency of a motor is the output power divided by the input power. Um, the output power of the motor, uh, you could write this as the torque of the motor times the RPM times you know 60 over two pi or two pi over 60. Um, but from conservation of energy or from logical deduction, you can also conclude that the torque output of the motor is the input power the, out, the output power of the motor is the input power minus the losses that we have inside the motor. Um, so efficiency is input power minus losses over input power. Um, and now the input power to the motor. And here, um, if you go back to the previous slide where we actually show a model of the motor, there's just the input power is the voltage times the amps going into the motor. So what's the uh, volt? The, so the motor voltage times the motor phase current. Um, and then the losses from the motor is the combination of the copper loss, I squared R, plus the hysteresis loss. So the drag torque times the, uh, the uh, rotational frequency of the motor, plus the eddy current losses, which increase at the rotational speed square. And then again, divided by the input power, which is V times I. 
Um, but now we know um, from the equation, the basic motor equation that was in that first presentation, the current through a motor, and this is just the simple application of Ohm's law to a very simple circuit that I thought I had the schematic for here, but I'm missing. Um, it's the voltage of the motor. This here is the voltage going into the motor. This here is the back EMF voltage, so the motor constant times the rotational speed. So this is the net voltage across the motor divided by the resistance. So this is just Ohm's law. Current is voltage, the net voltage across the motor divided by its resistance. And then you can substitute that back into this equation and do all of your basic first order algebra. And you wind up with this equation here for the efficiency of a motor. Um, and so that's uh, taking into account all the different losses. If you know the motor's resistance, if you notice its um, coefficients for hysteresis and eddy current drag, um, and you know the motor's uh, KV constant, the, the motor constant RPM per volt, you can generate an efficiency plot at any given motor voltage. Um, so all of these terms, the K, the resistance, A0 and A1, all of those, as I said, are listed in our specifications table for each motor. Um, so you can do this plot and then you'll, you know, you'll see a thing that has sort of a peak efficiency and then drops down to 0% efficiency. Um, and then if you wanna find what is the point of peak efficiency, well, if you've done any first order calculus, uh, you would take the derivative of this equation as a function of the RPM and you'd set that equal to zero, that's when the slope is nothing. And if you run through that math, you'll find out that the peak efficiency happens when the core losses that you see are exactly the same as the copper losses. Um, and to illustrate this point here, um, if you look at a, a dyno output curve, um, we have this point here of peak efficiency. And if I was to look at what is the, uh, so here we have the motor generating, you know, uh, just under 500 watts of power. The input power is gonna be somewhere around 600 or 580 watts or something. Uh, so let's just assume it's 580 watts. Um, we would have at this point exactly 40 watts going into core losses, so into the eddy current and the hysteresis, and we would have 40 watts going into copper losses. Um, so this point of peak efficiency, it's not some magical sweet spot to run the motor, it just it happens to be the area where the core losses and the copper losses are equal. And if you're running the motor over on this side of the curve, so say you're going downhill, you only need 200 watts from the motor, and the efficiency now is down to 80% instead of 83%. Um, at this point, we have more heat from the magnets moving over the iron than we have from current flowing through the copper generating torque. Um, and if we're going up a hill, say we're generating 800 watts, now we're over on this side of the curve. So here we have more heat being generated from current flowing through the windings in order to make the necessary torque to climb this hill and do 800 watts, um, that's gonna be quite a bit higher than the core losses. And this peak point is just for those two are equal. Nothing more fancy or special about that. Um, and to show how kind of not important that is and how um, sometimes a pursuit of purely improving the motor efficiency doesn't really res result in an output you might expect. If we wanted to increase this peak efficiency, well, clearly we wanna reduce our losses. So here I've taken the, the uh, uh, custom motor, and this is the same motor that we generated in the first presentation with you know, 10 RPM per volt, 0.3 ohms of winding resistance. Um, and, uh, and in this case, I set the hysteresis torque to 0.8 Newton meters. Um, so this would be a motor you know, with maybe thick laminations or a pretty poor grade of steel. Um, and the peak efficiency of the motor is uh, 81%. So not terrible, but nothing super special. Um, and then you think, okay, I'm gonna you know, put all of my engineering talent to make this the most efficient motor possible. Let's get the best grade steel that we can. Let's make these laminations as thin as we can. And bang, let's get our hysteresis loss uh, down to 0.4 Newton meters. That's a totally achievable goal. Um, and by doing that and paying this you know, premium stator design, uh, we've now increased the peak efficiency a huge amount uh, from 81% to 88%. Um, and so, you know, that's cutting our losses 
almost in half, or at least in by a third, um, for the peak efficiency point of the motor. And so you would think, wow, now we can boast this as like an almost 90% efficient motor. This must perform so much better um, than an 81% efficient motor. Um, you know, the sales and marketing team might say, oh, well, well, 10, you know, the difference between round that off to 90% versus 80%, that means that we have half the losses. So we should be able to kind of run double the power because our losses are half as much. Um, but in practice, reducing the, the uh, core losses really only affects the behavior when you're running at very low power levels. And so as we reduce the core loss in half, the peak efficiency point naturally moved to the right to the point where our, our torque is also half as much. So here we were generating you know, 10 Newton meters of torque. Now the peak efficiency happens at a little over five Newton meters of torque. And of course, at five Newton meters of torque, we're dealing with much less power. So this peak efficiency is only when the motor is generating 200 watts. Oops, sorry for <laughs> crossing out the 200. Um, whereas the peak efficiency when we were comparing it with the higher core losses happened at 300 watts. Um, what you wanna note about this curve is in spite of this way higher peak efficiency, um, the actual output curve of the motor, if you were to ride this on a bike, it's almost unchanged. The power output of the motor is almost indistinguishable. You can barely see, you can see if you look closely that the more efficient motor has ever so slightly higher output power, ever so slightly higher torque. And except in this region of, of high speed and very low power levels, the efficiency of the motor really doesn't change all that much either. So the efficiency curve at cases where you're dominated by copper losses, which is where you typically operate these motors when you're making power, the efficiency is barely improved at all. So again, marketing or choosing a motor based on a peak efficiency metric can throw you way off from what you wanna be pursuing. Uh, it only really matters if you're running this motor in this example at super low power levels, um, but at the power levels that are more often used on an e-bike, this peak efficiency, super high peak efficiency is somewhat irrelevant because your operating efficiency might be in this region over here when you're climbing a hill and then you're talking about the difference between 68 and 69 percent um so um so yeah i wanted to use that as an example of uh of how you can improve motor efficiency but how it may not really have the effect that you were thinking it might um now we'll talk about improving the motor efficiency by leaving the um core loss is the same. So I'm leaving them at 0.8 Newton meters, but instead of, uh, yeah, and instead of reducing the core loss, I'm now going to somehow reduce the copper loss. So the, you know, ideal way you could do this would be that instead of having round copper and having gaps in the stator, if you could just get like perfectly extruded square copper with the thinnest possible insulation between them and just fill every single void inside that slot, um, or, uh, you know, you could run silver instead of copper and then run the motor at cryogenic temperatures so the resistance is much lower. Um, or you could, you know, make the motor have a deeper slot so that you can fit more copper around each tooth um, and that would effectively increase the uh, area and that uh, increase the area for copper and reduce the winding resistance. And that's the most realistic possibility here. So here I took exactly the same hypothetical motor with uh, 10 RPM per volt, 0.3 ohms resistance and now I drop that phase resistance to 0.15 ohms but I leave everything else the same and so once again we do get a higher peak efficiency um, because we have less copper loss so at this point our copper loss is going to be lower than our core losses so we can uh, reduce the power output until um, uh, those two uh, factors uh, become equal um, and uh, uh, but what you notice here is that in this case, we get this boost in peak efficiency, but we also get a massive increase in efficiency across the entire speed range at these, and we get a higher output power from the motor and a higher torque from the motor for everything else being the same. It's the same battery voltage, the same motor controller. Um, so re reducing the winding resistance affects not only this peak efficiency, but it much more significantly affects the efficiency over this kind of range where you're often using the bike. And it's in this range here where you often consume most of the battery pack. So riding at a high speed at you know 200 watts of power is gonna, even if your efficiency is really good, you're not using much of your energy there compared to when you hit a hill, you now might be doing 700, 800 watts of power 
even if you're only climbing a hill for half the time, you use maybe twice as much battery as you do on the flat section. And a better efficiency here has a much better net effect on how far you get for a given battery pack. Um, and so increasing, if you were to reduce the copper loss by going to a deeper slot, you will increase the core losses in the motor, but you, and you may end up having a worse peak efficiency. If you do, if you do this simulation realistically, um, your peak efficiency might go down, but your efficiency at meaningful power levels can go up a lot. Um, and the other way that you can effectively reduce the winding resistance of the motor is by gearing it down. So using a smaller resistance, sorry, a smaller diameter wheel or having a, a gear ratio between the motor. So if you're dealing with a geared motor instead of a five to one gear, you could put a, you know, an eight to one planetary gear inside hypothetically. Um, then you can have a faster wound motor, which would have less resistance, but then the gearing makes it have the same final KV and you'll wind up with improved motor power. Um, you may have a lower peak efficiency, um, but you'll have a better efficiency over a range that's important. Um, so uh, what does this come down to? Uh, when it comes to selecting the right motor for an application, if you wanted to, to make you know, an optimal motor choice, you would look at what, uh, what your typical trip looks like, how much flat ground riding, how much uphills, how much downhills, uh, run a simulation over kind of a representative number of that and pick a motor where in some cases like riding on the flats, you might have higher core losses than copper losses or in other cases um, going up hills, your copper losses will be higher than your core losses. Um, but that would be sort of a well-chosen motor where the, the size of the motor is appropriate for your average load that you're subjecting it to. Um, so if you have a big motor, but you're not using it at high power levels, then you're often going to be riding the motor to the right side of that peak efficiency, and you would have been actually better off with a smaller motor. Um, and uh, the converse, if you have a small motor, you'll often be stressing the motor at, with generating more torque than it can do very well, and you would have been better off with a bigger motor. Um, so now I'm going to go back and play around a little bit with uh, optimizations under this viewpoint of efficiency. So early on in this first example I gave about kind of why not to care about motor efficiency, um, I, uh, I, you know, discussed how, you know, you think, oh, motors are more efficient going faster, so it's better to go up a hill. And then I showed in the uh, actual test results for that or simulation results, even though the motor efficiency is better, you end up using more battery pack going fast and going slow, and it makes sense to go up a hill slowly. And that's a little bit more intuitive for somebody with a bit of not with not much knowledge. You give a bit of knowledge about motors, they think, oh, I should climb the hill fast. If you give a lot of knowledge, um, you then understand that at lower speeds, it was the reason why the efficiency, why we use less battery was largely, I mean, A, we had less losses to air drag, but we also had a higher percentage of our, um, of the energy to climb that hill coming from the human input. Um, if you were to climb a hill without pedaling, um, so in this case, we're letting the motor do all the work. Now we don't have that benefit that lower speeds reduce the amount of motor work required. Um, so the torque in this case is constant when you need to climb a hill. Um, uh, the torque to overcome gravity is constant and all of that torque has to come from the motor. And so here with no pedaling, if you were to climb the hill, say at two kilometers an hour, uh, let's just use a 10% hill here, we need 35 newton meters of torque and 35 newton meters of torque might make, uh, depending on the motor KV, that might be like 40 amps of phase current. 40 amps of phase current is gonna generate from I squared R a given amount of heat. And if you're climbing at two and a half kilometers an hour, it's gonna take a long time to climb that hill. And during that entire duration of the climb, you're gonna have that fixed amount of heat in order to generate the torque to overcome gravity. If instead you climb the hill at five kilometers an hour, the torque is almost exactly the same. The torque needed on the motor barely changes between two and a half to five, but at five kilometers an hour, you're gonna climb that hill in half the time. And climbing it in half the time means that we're subjecting the motor to those losses for half as long. So the motor is gonna get less hot and we're gonna burn less energy um, to, uh, to do that climb. And this holds true even if you go to 10 kilometers an hour. So at 10 kilometers an hour, the torque is a little bit more than at two and a half or five, because now we're starting to have a little bit of effect from air resistance, but it's only slightly. So our power loss to heat is gonna go up just a little bit, 
Um, but again, we're going to climb that hill in half the time that we did at five kilometers an hour. So even though we have a little bit more heat in the hub, exposing it for half the time should still result in less heat in the motor and less consumption from the battery pack. Um, and at some point, as you get going faster and faster, then the torque required, uh, is, which is increasing from air resistance, is now going to mean that the um, uh, that there we're now generating more heat. The, we, we can no longer assume that the heat generation is constant. This I squared R is now higher because we need more torque because of this air drag that's been added. And somewhere in there, there is an actual optimal, most efficient speed to climb a hill. So um, this is a, a fun hypothetical question to ask. And what's, it's something that has <laughs> said sort of since day one been on my mind as an experiment that we wanted to do. And, and uh, one of the first uh, fun little experiments we had uh, with uh, our co-op students, I think it was in 2007 or 2008, uh, we had him take an e-bike and then ride up a hill and then do that ride at 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 kilometers an hour, um, and then log how many amp hours was used from the battery pack at each of those different speeds, and then make a neat little plot of it. Um, I couldn't find where that data wound up because that was so long ago. Um, but now with our simulator tools, we don't have to spend an afternoon running this kind of experiment to answer this question, what's the optimal speed to climb a hill? Uh, we can just, again, run a simulation set. Um, so here. Um, where I'll, again, it's the same as I showed you early on. Um, I'm going to use as an example uh, a direct drive hub motor climbing up a 6% hill, and we simply vary the throttle from 5 to 100%, um, and we make sure that the human power is at 0 watts in this simulation. Um, and then the simulation runs through the gamut of things. It outputs the data in a text file. You copy that to a spreadsheet, and here's what this number looks like. So. Uh, what I've got here are, are four different things being plotted. The green plot here is the motor efficiency. So climbing up a 6% grade hill, um, the efficiency gets better and better and better and better the faster that you climb. So this is a similar result that we had in uh, that first case where if all you were cared about was motor efficiency, you would want to get up that hill as fast as you humanly can. Um, you can see that, you know, even at 42, 43 kilometers an hour, my efficiency is better than at these lower speeds. But if you look at this plot here, so this here is the uh, motor temperature. Um, and then this is the steady state temperature. So this is if the, if the hill went on indefinitely. Um, you can see that at some point you can't actually sustain climbing it at these speeds without the motor eventually overheating. Um, what's interesting to us is not what's the peak efficiency of the motor. It's what is the peak efficiency in terms of your battery use in watt hours per kilometer. So this plot here is the watt hours per kilometer used. And this is directly proportional to how many amp hours you would use from the battery climbing the hill. So if we include this, this in the plot, the minimum of this value is when we would use the least amount of battery to climb that hill. It's not the most efficient use of the motor but it is the most efficient use of the battery pack. And ultimately, that's what you would often care about. Um, if you are on a trip or riding your bike, you'd want to see, well, what's, <laughs> how would I get to the top of the hill and have the most amount of battery left over? But you would do that by finding the point where your watt hours per kilometer is the highest. And for this particular motor up a 6% grade hill, that happens at just under 20 kilometers an hour. Um, our mileage is 30.8 watt hours per kilometer. The motor is 70% efficient. And if you were to go faster than this, you would end up consuming a little bit more from the battery. If you go slower, you also consume more. Now, one thing you'll see is that it is really quite flat. So you in practice, you really wouldn't notice much difference between a 15 kilometer an hour climb or a 25 kilometer an hour climb. Um, by and large, you'll use roughly the same amount of the battery. If that's the case, well, you might as well climb the hill faster and get it done, get it over with sooner than climb it more slowly and use the same amount of battery pack. Um, so that is the you know, meaningful answer for what's the most efficient speed for me to climb this hill with one motor at one grade hill. Um, what's interesting and what I'd love you as an audience to spend time doing, if you're curious about these things, is do this simulation with different motors up different grade hills with different types of vehicles. Um, and, uh, and I've done some examples of that as we move through the slides here. So here's the exact same setup, but instead of climbing 6%, I'm now climbing a 3% hill. 
Um, and so interestingly, if the slope of the hill is lower, it's more efficient or you use less of your battery pack climbing that hill even more slowly. Um, and at first this might seem counterintuitive, certainly as you have a, a gentler grade hill, you can more easily go fast without um, heating up as much power or heating up the, you can easily go as fast without using much power. Um, but when your hill grade is lower, there's less of a constant torque as a result of gravity. And so the percentage of your torque that's overcoming air drag is higher compared to the total uh, torque that you're dealing with. Um, and it works out that the least amount of battery use happens at a lower speed. And if we extrapolate this right down to a 0% grade hill riding on the flat, the least amount of battery that you use on flat ground is when you travel really, really slow. It's like, I, I didn't do the simulation, it's somewhere like four or five kilometers an hour, because there the only torque that you're dealing with is the rolling resistance torque, and that's quite low. And as soon as you start going faster, you're adding any kind of air drag. And as soon as you have air drag to add to the equation, you are now increasing the amount of energy needed to move from A to B, which means more energy out of the battery pack. Um, and so going in the other direction, which I didn't simulate, but as you go to steeper and steeper grade hills, you find that your uh, optimal speed to climb that hill to use the least amount of battery keeps increasing the steeper the hill it, that you have to climb. So that doesn't mean that when you're riding a bike, you should go up gentle hills slowly and steep hills fast. Uh, in practice, when you're riding the bike, you're pedaling and adding a human power to this curve massively changes everything. Um, but if you're making a pure electric vehicle and your goal is to get from A to B using the least amount of energy, um, you should travel generally really slowly, except when you see a hill. And when you go up hills, you should actually increase your speed. Um, may, may or may not have been intuitive, but that's what an optimal efficiency, optimal uh, battery efficiency uh, usage would look like. Um, now we do that same hill climb. 6% um, grade, uh, but instead of being on an upright mountain bike, we'll switch this over to a Velomobile. So here I've run the same simulation, but I've changed to a custom vehicle where my coefficient of air drag is 0 0.2 instead of 0 0.58 I used on the other one. Um, now that the air drag, now that I'm on a, a more aerodynamic vehicle, you see that the torque here uh, to move the vehicle, the, the, the motor torque, is increasing much, much, much more gradually with speed than it was in this one here, where you have a more significant ramp up. Um, so here, whoops. Okay. Um, and uh, so as a result, the optimal efficiency, the, the least energy uh, climb happens faster. It's closer to 27 kilometers an hour versus 18 kilometers an hour for a less aerodynamic vehicle. Um, and you can run this test, as I said, with different motors. So here I ran the same experiment, but I've used the small geared Bafang motor um, up a 6% grade. And you'll notice I um, didn't have time to, to put the exact marker point, but it actually ends up being very, very similar to the direct drive motor. Where it's somewhere between 15 to 20 kilometers an hour, uses the least amount of battery. I'm consuming somewhere around 30 watt hours per kilometer. Um, so you'd think, okay, with this Bafang motor, I should treat it exactly as I did the direct drive uh, all axle motor um, for highest efficiency or least battery use climbing without pedaling. But if you look at the temperature plot, it's just completely off the charts. Um, so even though the Bafang motor performance is similar to the, uh, to the direct drive motor, um, it won't be able to sustain that for very long before the motor overheats and it can't sustain any, it simply can't do a 6% grade climb at any speed without overheating. Um, now in practice, you can use this motor to climb a hill no problem because you would be pedaling and the pedal load would take off some of the torque load from the motor and there would be a speed where the motor temperature doesn't overheat and you could sustainably and continuously climb 6% with the small motor. But if you were to set up a vehicle where you weren't pedaling and you chose a small motor like this, you would not uh, be advised <laughs> to climb a 6% grade hill that uh, lasted very long because the motor would inevitably overheat. Um, and interestingly, I did the same experiment with the GMAC motor, so a much more powerful geared motor. And with the GMAC motor, we again see the optimal speed to climb a hill to use the least amount of a 6% hill to use the least amount of battery energy is somewhere around 15 
14 to 15 kilometers an hour. Um, but in all of these cases, it is pretty flat over a decent range here. So going 20 or 25 isn't markedly increasing the, the consumption. And you can see with this GMAC motor, um, instead of being 30 watt hours per kilometer, my consumption's a little bit better. It's like 23 or so. Um, and, uh, and then the motor temperature, it's hot, but it's still a tenable value. So running the motor at 120 Celsius is not going to cause permanent damage. It is cutting it a little bit thin to where you'd want to have some thermal protection in there. Um, but this motor could do that climb continuously, um, not overheat. Um, and uh, yeah, and I found it curious. There were three very different motors, a really small geared motor, a really large geared motor, and a direct drive motor. They all pointed to the same optimal hill climbing speed for least battery usage and a similar uh, behavior as you increase your speed or decrease your speed beyond those points. So yeah, those are you know a, an example of how to, to use our simulator tool to really answer this question analytically and, uh, and quantitatively rather than just qualitatively. Um, so there's a lot more stuff you can play with about hypotheticals for most efficient or optimal use, uh, depending on what it is you're trying to optimize. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, mid-drive motors with the same kind of optimization. Um, so, so far, everything I've been talking about was with regards to hub motors, where you can't change the relationship between the uh, vehicle speed and the motor RPM. And um, what's interesting is that in spite of the fact that you can't change that relationship, because the power out of a motor, power capability of a motor increases with speed, and the power required to move a vehicle also increases with the speed. You wind up that over quite a broad range of percent grades and speed ranges, that fixed ratio of the motor still gives a broadly efficient vehicle setup. Um, now, a mid drive motor is different in that now we have the ability to vary how we deliver a given output power. So regardless of how fast the vehicle is going, if a vehicle needs 500 watts, we can generate 500 watts from our mid-drive motor, um, but we have a choice in how we make that 500 watts. We could make 500 watts by doing a high torque of the motor, so running it at a pretty high phase current, but with the motor spinning slowly, or we could have 500 watts spinning the motor really fast, but with a lower torque. And we can do have anywhere in between there. So there's, there's, in a mid-drive setup, you can um, continuously or within the limits of your gearing, switch over for a given power to be higher speed, lower torque or lower speed, higher torque. And that's something you can't do in a hub motor vehicle. Um, and so once again, if you say you need, you want 500 watts from a mid-drive motor, if you're running that motor, say you're pedaling at 60 RPM and generating 500 watts, if you were to study from our simulator where is the inefficiency coming from, you might see that, oh, I'm losing uh, 100 watts to copper losses, and I'm only losing 50 watts to the core losses of the motor. So if you had this knowledge, you would then know, well, I could improve my efficiency by spinning the motor faster at less torque, and then instead of 100 watts of copper loss, my copper loss might drop down to 70 watts and my core loss or 60 watts and my core loss will increase a little bit also to 60 watts. But my total losses being 120 watts are less than when I had 100 watts of copper and 70 or 50 watts of core, whatever I just said. So there's, you know, if your core losses are here, your copper losses are here. Um, for If you want to improve the efficiency, for every amount that you reduce the co the, the copper losses, um, the core losses increase only a little bit. So the total losses go down, and that's the point where they're equal is where you would have the most efficiency. And then if you go further, if you reduce the copper losses even further, so now you spin the motor even faster at a really high pedal cadence, now your core losses start to skyrocket. And then again, your total losses are higher, and you're not running at the peak efficiency. Um, so an interesting point about this is that a lot of the assumptions about mid drives is people think, okay, well, there's a sweet, you know, optimal efficiency for the motor. And then with, the, you know, you set that optimal efficiency to be your pedaling cadence. And now with a mid drive, presto, the motor's always running at optimal efficiency. So therefore it's, you know, the best way to use a motor. Um, and that is not true. Uh, the 
that's only true if you're running the mid-drive motor at constant power. So that's if you ride an e-bike and you always want 250 watts from the motor, then for sure, there would be a one specific motor RPM and one pedal cadence where uh, it would be generating 250 watts with the highest efficiency, but that would mean going up a really steep hill, you're only using 250 watts. Going down a hill really fast, you're still using 250 watts. Um, and uh, and then if that's how you want to ride the e-bike, then that works out really well. Um, if you want to use more power climbing a hill so that you can get the hills over with faster and not have your speed change very much, then the power needs of an e-bike change with your... Um, uh, with your terrain. Um, and the consequence of that is that the optimal gearing for the motor also changes. And that means that the optimal use of a mid-drive motor is not a constant pedal cadence for the rider. It's a pedal cadence that actually varies with the RPM. Um, and so here uh, we can uh, illustrate this a little bit. So on our motor simulator, we have uh, a couple of common mid-drive motors. So here I'm simulating with the, um, the BBSO2 motor. Um, and if I run a simulation at, you know, with a 36 volt battery pack, um, to simplify things, I've used uh, the same two front and rear chain ring um, because the plot here I wanted to be in terms of RPM. Um, and so now this axis here, it's not the speed of the vehicle, it's the pedal cadence of the pedals. Um, and so the BBSO2 with a 36 volt battery running full throttle has a peak efficiency point of uh, 87.7 RPM, so about 90 RPM. And at that peak efficiency, the motor is generating, if you look over here, um, just under 300 watts of power. Um, so this motor is, if your goal from the motor is to make 300 watts, to ride with 300 watts of power, you should be pedaling at around 90 RPM. If you're pedaling at, say, 120 RPM, but you're only using 300 watts from the motor, you're actually using burning through your battery faster than if you actually switch to a harder gear and pedal more slowly to keep the motor running at closer to 90 RPM. Um, now, if we you know, run the simulation at a slightly lower throttle level, just to get a different peak efficiency point, here I'm at 70% throttle, um, and then I looked, okay, what's my peak efficiency? Um, now, the peak efficiency happens at 65 RPM, and it's at a point where the motor is generating, look over here, 175 watts of power, or you can just see it right there. So if you wanted to use your BBSO2 drive and you didn't really want that much power, you just wanted to ride at you know, 150 to 200 watts, you're most efficient if you choose your pedal gearing so that you're always pedaling at around 65 RPM at a slower cadence. Um, and, uh, and so with, with a mid-drive setup, a, uh, and this, if you, go back to the sort of the fundamentals of the motor, um, the less power that you want a motor to generate, the lower you want to be spinning because a lower the, the core losses are directly proportional to the RPM. If you're not generating much power, you don't want to have much core losses. And to reduce your core losses, you want to spin the motor more slowly. Um, so this whole process, we can extrapolate instead of having, uh, you know, here I did it for two discrete points. Unfortunately, I couldn't find an, a nice way to automate generating all of these values in a plot uh, with the simulation set with just a simple copy and paste. I had to, to run a simulation set with copying the entire data and spend a fair bit more time on a spreadsheet to pull it off. Um, but by doing that, this is the curve that we got. So this here, if you wanted to know or use a, a mid-drive motor, the BBSO2, and have it running at optimal efficiency, um, you would vary the art you'd switch around your gearing so that the rpm of your pedals is matched to the power output that you need for that particular application so if you wanted to generate a thousand watts from a bbso2 um, it's best if you're riding the bike such that your pedals are at look at over here uh about 180 rpm well nobody can actually pedal at 180 RPM. I shouldn't say nobody, a unicyclist with very short cranks can do that fairly well. Um, but it's not a very comfortable uh, 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 thing for an average cyclist to, to spin their legs around that fast. Um, but that's what you would want to do if you wanted the motor to be at its peak efficiency. So in practice, if you were trying to get a thousand watts so the, from a BBSO2, um, if you're not pedaling, you would 
gear down, gear down until the motor is spinning at 180 RPM, and then you'd be running it at its most efficient point. Uh, and in practice, if you're actually wanting to contribute uh, with your human human effort, you would be uh, not geared uh, uh, for such a high pedal cadence, and then the motor efficiency wouldn't be as optimal as it could be, and you'd be generating more heat than you otherwise could be, given that you have a mid-drive setup. Um, and so this plot here lets you see. So this purple line is the uh, pedal RPM that you would want for a given output power, or the most efficient pedal RPM as a function of power from the motor. Um, and so if you see this bike, if you're, you see, okay, well, a cyclist is typically riding between 70 to 100 RPM, and we typically want the motor generating between you know, 200 to 400 watts of power, well, you can see that it's a really well-designed system to be operating near its you know, efficiency, its peak efficiency zone within those parameters. Um, so if you're doing 300 watts on the motor, you're pedaling around 90 RPM. If you want 400 watts, you should increase your cadence to about 100. If you just want a leisurely amount of or less assistance, 200 watts, you spin the cranks at 60. Um, so, you know, you can argue that, you know, when Bafang set up this motor, when they chose the internal gear ratios, um, they really planned that out so that it was operating as efficiently as it could over the expected uh, RPM and torques for uh, that specific system. But if you're designing a mid-drive to enter, you know, e-bike competitions that are win some hill climbing races, um, and you're not constrained by trying to fix, run at a constant human pedal cadence, um, then you can use the simulator tools here and really get, find out what is truly the optimal gearing for any given power output and change your gearing based on this curve here. Um, so that is the last of what I have prepared for this presentation, just showing another perspective on motor efficiency and where it comes into play with systems that have variable gearing um, and so um, for the rest of you guys, I'm hoping that uh, having shown how you can do these, how you can use the simulation set on our website um, in order to run through um, these things and do spreadsheet comparisons that we'll see a much more elevated uh, analytic uh, conclusions or answers to questions and discussions that often come up uh, on forums and on uh, on the e-bike community. And I'd like to see people do a better job of dispelling incorrect information that's out there. Um, and I also hope that you saw that uh, um, as far as an exercise goes in optimizing efficiency, a little bit is kind of pedantic or um, you know OCD. Um, really, if you're trying to set up an e-bike and choose your components and you're not really sure what you should get, um, look for systems that meet your objectives. Don't really concern yourself if you're running it you know, 82% efficiency or 79% efficiency. Um, there's very, very few applications where that level of uh, finesse in the consumption of the choice of parts really matters. Because uh, most of the time, energy is abundant and cheap. Uh, lithium batteries are light. Uh, lithium batteries are fairly inexpensive uh, in the big picture, and especially compared to what they used to be. Um, and so energy is not a rare commodity. And, uh, and otherwise, I uh, will open the floor for any questions in the chat box here for a little bit. Um, so I, uh, I'm just going to sc scroll through to see if there's ones that came up during my talk that I want to answer. But if people have other thoughts or questions or comments that they want to make, um, I'll, uh, I'll uh, respond to them in kind here. I do think that was the last thing I have prepared. Let me just. Yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Um. So. <laughs> um, I would absolutely welcome anyone to make a uh, true simulation. Um, one thing that, so uh, I'm not a gamer at all myself, and uh, and I wish less of my generation and my gender were obsessed with gaming and more in the real world. But um, one of the things that is kind of fun, and I do see that a lot of people appreciate these tools more when they're not presented um, analytically and numerically, but visually and graphically. Um, and one of the things that we're planning to work on, and I'm just going to switch my... Um, my screen share for a second to uh, show you a simulator instead. Um, so, share screen. 
Um, so, actually, um, so one of the things that we that I so most of what I've been showing you is with our motor simulator. Um, what we're working on, and I, I now have a couple more um, web developer co-op students uh, at Grin to help us finally flesh out our final details here. Um, we did create a trip simulator that is a little bit more game-like in how it works. Um, and so this tool, you can sort of draw out any hypothetical elevation profile. So here I'm you know, creating an imaginary terrain where I'm climbing up an 8% hill. You can see my distance in kilometers here, the elevation here. You can have uphills, downhills, whatever you want. Um, and now I can choose any motors that we've got uh, with a full thermal modeling done. So let's you know, look at a Bafang fat bike motor. Um, pick and choose any type of riding, actually fat bike, let's make that with a nice heavy rolling resistance. Um, and, uh, and with this tool, um, unlike the motor simulator that's showing simply a, actually I think I have to zoom out one more, there we go, um, that's just sort of a, a fixed snapshot time, um, the trip simulator shows the time evolving um, behavior of a, of a motor simulation. Um, and uh, when you view this, so now what I've done is I've drawn this elevation curve. Um, on this second graph here, we can see the temperature of the motor. So you can see it gets up to 60, 65 degrees. Now as I go downhill, it cools off a bit. And then it climbs again, reaches 90 degrees at the end. So if you click at any point on this graph, you can see how fast you're going, what the temperatures are, the great hill that you're climbing. And then you also have a really detailed breakdown of how many watts is going to um, your copper losses and how many watts are core losses. And here you can see, remember I talked about the optimal efficiency happening when those two numbers are very close to each other. So here the motor is being run pretty close to an optimal efficiency. Uh, one point I wanna make about this is that the efficiency in our trip simulator is the actual motor efficiency. Um, and so that's the efficiency only as seen from the motor. In our motor simulator application, um, so if you go tools, motor simulator, um, here we also have an efficiency number. The efficiency that I show in the motor simulator is not just the motor efficiency, it's the efficiency from the motor controller to the motor output. So it's if you were looking at the energy flowing out of the battery, and it means that losses inside the motor controller are also part of this. And so you'll see in our trip simulator higher efficiencies than in the motor simulator. Uh, and that's because the efficiency is being measured from a different point. I explained down here um, where the efficiency is coming from. So it's the power out of the hub motor to the electrical power going into the controller. And on our trip simulator, it's the power out of the hub motor converted the power going into the motor. Um, and uh, the, when I'm getting back to this gaming thing of things, um, so we added here the ability to then uh, simulate what this looks like in a time time based analysis. So if you hit this ride button, you can now see the bike climbing up the hill, and you can see what's happening to the speed, where the power is going. You can see the power going lost to wind drag. You can see the motor doing regenerative braking. You see how much power is going to drag. All these different components that make up the system. You can see the temperature of the motor increasing during that climb, um, and uh, and our hope was to to make it a little bit more fun um, to give that kind of visual um, and what you can do with this tool. Um, here I've shown how you can look at the data at a given point. You can also look at the consumption over a region. So say you're curious for this portion of the climb, um, how much power do I use going from the bottom of this hill to the top? Um, so when you right click in this secondary graph, um, it lets you highlight a region. So now I'm highlighting this region from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill, and that creates a section. And I can see in this section, this is a nine kilometer stretch, and I can see what my consumption, what my metrics are. So during this stretch of the climb, I've used, you know, I'm, I'm using 28 watt hours per kilometer. You see at your average speed, you see how much of the battery you've used. Um, if it's a section that has regenerative braking, you can see how much you get back into the battery during regen, and you can see where your losses are coming from. So here, you see my copper losses are much higher than my core losses. So doing this climb, um, I would be more efficient if I could somehow spin the motor faster and have less 
um, less torque um, and more core losses because I can afford more core losses if it's going to make my copper losses go down quite a bit. Um, so I can leave this simulation as is with the same section highlighted where you can see I'm using 28.9 watt hours per kilometer. And I could simulate or see what, what it would look like if I was to switch that uh, um, motor usage over this region. So actually what I'm going to do now is I'm first just going to set a speed limit, say 20 kilometers an hour. Um, I'm going to do this simulation at a fixed speed. Um, and so to do that, I'm just going to run a higher voltage battery. Um, so now you can see my speed, this green line is totally constant. Um, so this way I'm doing an, an apples to apples comparison. So climbing this hill, doing this hill climb at uh, 20 kilometers an hour, um, I used 24.9 watt hours per kilometer. If I was to have a 20 inch wheel bike, now at a smaller wheel size, I need less torque, um, but I need to also spin at a higher RPM. And so that's gonna require um, more, that's gonna cause more core losses. Um, but the net effect should be a better efficiency. So here I used, uh, as I said, just under 25 watt hours per kilometer. If I switch that to a 20 inch wheel, well, we're still climbing at the same speed. You notice that the motor temperature didn't get as hot. And if we look at these consumptions, I'm now down to 23.8 watt hours per kilometer. So I'm a little bit more, less battery usage. And if you look, my copper losses dropped down. They used to be at it was, I can't remember, 27 or 28. Now it's down to 14. And they went down much more than my core losses went up. Um, so in this tool, we actually break out those numbers so you can see um, how it plays into uh, the setup. And by looking at that, you can know if you need to move the motor, spin the motor faster or slower um, for uh, improvement towards better efficiency. Um, and uh, so, yeah, what we'd like to do is, is uh, play improve the GUI of this so it is a little bit more game-like so people can sort of see better visuals of motors heating up of, of losses inside the different components um, and then um, but the physics of this um, it is doing sort of a decently accurate steady state physics um, it's not uh, one thing that it's not doing is modeling momentum um, so if for instance you have a short hill and then you go back up it doesn't simulate the inertia that the bicycle has. That's another component that we may add to it. But given that our primary purpose was to model the heating up of motors and over much longer time trips where the inertia is not so relevant, um, it does give sort of a, a gamified <laughs> view of the, the actual physics here. Um, so, um, and uh, so, um, uh, this was uh, came up during the course of my presentation, but talking about uh, CVTs for a continuously variable transmission. Um, and uh, one of the things that um, I hope that you do appreciate from the uh, the presentation where I showed how kind of in practice these motors have super, super broad um, efficiency curves when you're looking at not the full throttle output power, but when you're looking at the actual output given the torque that's needed. Um, and I will redo that simulation here. I'll just do a custom controller. Um, and instead of making it in torque throttle, I'm going to make it an amps, uh, instead of a voltage throttle, we'll make it a torque throttle, run that at a low torque. Um, you see that in practice, you have efficiency curves that are a little bit more like this. And so um, having super discrete uh, RPMs needing a, a, the necessity of a CVT almost isn't there at all with an e-bike, even in a mid-motor bike. So if you go, if you go back to the presentation slides where we showed that curve for optimal efficiency points, um, they're often very very flat over a broad range. So having discrete steps of gearing um, doesn't have too much of a significant effect in um, in choosing a point where you're running at a good efficiency all the while. So a CVT is really valuable for the human pedal cadence. It's really nice when your leg RPM doesn't switch discreetly, um, but motors can have pretty discrete jumps in speed um, and still have a still be hovering very, very near whatever that super peak RPM might be um, uh, because it's it doesn't deviate very much as you go to either side of that. Um, so um, and 
So can you... Um, so this question here from Bill, can you explain why it's difficult for motor controllers to provide high motor braking torque at low speed while regenerating? Uh, I absolutely can, but I wanna save this for a presentation that's all about regenerative braking. Um, so this isn't a, a question about efficiency, um, but I've had a lot of people emailing us back or, or giving us feedback in the comments on what they would like us to talk about in, in future presentations and um, uh, regenerative braking and all about regen uh, is definitely one of the uh, most voted for or most requested uh, topics and uh, so it's a topic where um, we'll go into quite some depth about um, uh, regenerative braking torque and what the, the limits are and how much regen you can do without the motor controller starting to use battery energy instead of putting it back into the battery pack. Um, so we will answer that bill uh, probably in about three weeks time and, uh, and I'll look forward to, to a really deep dive on this topic. Um, and uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so, um, so yeah, there's CVTs are, are interesting and elegant and, and fun uh, topics, but they um, very rarely make sense in electric drive systems because uh, intrinsically CVTs are almost always more lossy than fixed ratio transmissions, and you really don't stand to gain much benefit from a really fine um, resolution inside that. Um, so. I am wondering now if there's any more questions people have or if uh, if that covered everything in as much detail as you cared to hear about. Um, yeah, I, I agree so much on this front. Um, uh, yeah, so anyways, if there's uh, nothing more, uh, feel free for people who aren't <laughs> Um, who aren't watching this uh, live, um, I do generally scan all of the comments on our YouTube videos every couple days or at least once a week, um, and I'm happy to answer further questions of a technical nature in the comments section and try to share that with people. Um, and again, I keep mentioning how I'm going to make all of these presentations, the slides available on our website uh, with links to all the different simulations. I'm still planning that um, as you uh, are uh, likely fully aware the whole industry of cycling and e-bikes has just gone bonkers busy this summer. Um, and so I've had uh, uh, much less time than I thought I might have for, for doing website work and content generation, but eventually um, that will be the case. Oh, here is uh, um, a question that I did uh, would, would love to talk about. Um, so this is how does flux weakening or field weakening affect things? Um, so field weakening um, definitely uh, affects things in that it decreases uh, I suppose it increases the um, copper losses that you end up having inside the motor without generating any additional torque. Uh, so when you do field weakening, you're effectively putting current into the motor winding um, in advance. It's effective, it, it, in the end, it becomes very similar to just doing phase advance. Um, and so you have current flowing through the copper that's not generating torque, but it is generating heat. Um, but because of the inductance of the motor, it allows you to have current flowing through the motor even beyond the normal maximum speed. So this particular setup is maxed out at 48 kilometers an hour. I can't get any amps through this motor beyond 48 kilometers an hour because the voltage generated by the motor is the same as my the voltage of my battery pack. Um, so if I wanted to get power at a higher speed, we can use field weakening, which will allow current to flow through the stator even when the back EMF voltage is higher by putting the current through before the back EMF is over those poles. Um, and, uh, and then um, we do get output power here, but at a lower efficiency than if we simply had a higher voltage battery pack. Um, but the quanti quantitative basis of that, I have no idea. I haven't sat down and, and done the math or even thought about how we would build that into our motor simulator model. Um, but it's a topic that I would love to uh, hire a PhD student uh, to do for me so we can add that component to our simulation tools. Um, but ultimately, um, you, whenever you're using field weakening, you're not being as efficient as if you had a higher voltage or a faster KV motor for the same situation. Um, and, uh, and so this is another question. Can we give a simple explanation for how to use your simulators with unlisted motors? That is also a, another topic that I would love to do in its own presentation. Um, part of why it hasn't made it higher up the priority list is that I actually want to simplify 
this interface. So here you can do a custom motor and we provide you know, all these fields for making a custom motor, um, which you could in theory measure for any motor that you have. Um, but the explanation here doesn't, it explains in analytic terms to somebody who has a background in um, electronics and physics, they'd be able to read this and make sense of it. It doesn't really tell you hands-on, here's a motor, here's a multimeter, here's a tachometer to measure RPM. Now figure out what is my A0 and my A1 terms in Newton meters per radian per second. Um, we're planning to have a second tab here. This will be the advanced tab. And then we're going to have a simple tab where you could model a motor. And instead of you putting in these uh, coefficients in SI units, you would then in the, put in numbers that you can measure directly. So you put in how many no load amps at a given voltage and a given RPM. And then you run the motor at a different RPM and you tell it how many no load amps you measured at that RPM and what the voltage was. Um, and then some stuff you have to measure directly, like the resistance and the inductance. There's no shortcut to measuring that other than using an inductance, a resistance or an inductance meter. Um, and, uh, but then, uh, then we'd be able to make the custom motors much easier for people, uh, much more facilitated for people um, to take advantage of the simulator tool for motors we don't have in our drop down. So that will be later. Um, but for now, um, uh, that's. Uh, not something that I'm uh, uh, that I've filled out here, and I, I kind of want to update. I don't want to give a presentation based on this information. I want to do this, wait until we've actually made a, a simplified interface to putting in custom motors here, and then I'll have a presentation talking about that. Um, and uh, and exactly, so this is this is another example of this. Um, and in general, I mean, a lot of people say, "Hey, how come we don't have this motor, this motor?" There's there's so many motors out there um, in the uh, uh, in the electric vehicle industry, it used to be that I, I kind of had an aspiration to try and have every single model, every single motor available here. Uh, but the industry has blown up way faster than my ability to source, dyno test, characterize the motors that are out there. Um, and so there's a lot of shortcuts to either using an existing motor. So if you have, you know, a small geared motor that looks like the Outrider motor, um, you could use this motor and simply adjust the KV for the motor in order to um, emulate one that has your exact winding. Um, and, uh, and then soon we'll have it so it's more straightforward to add new custom ones. Um, but I can't, uh, at the moment, the motors that we populate here are motors that um, we at Grin have a curiosity to analyze, either because it's uh, you know has some new kind of technology in the industry or something that we're considering to carry within our product offerings uh, but we're no longer really having people ship us motors for us to dyno test just because they're curious uh, because we're, we're just uh, too backlogged with time but hopefully simplifying the custom motor generation tool will make it easier for people like you to add motors that you have in your possession or find somebody with a bit more electrical skills to add that motor. And one of the things that uh, you should know about whenever you do a custom motor like this, uh, so say um, you have a friend who's an electrical engineer and you give them the motor and they're able to measure all of these parameters for you. Um, once you've done that, you don't have to type in every time you run the simulator, you don't have to re-input that custom motor. All of the custom fields um, are inside the URL. So if you copy this URL, that has all the parameters for this custom motor. Um, and then you could just, you know, create a bookmark in your bookmarks toolbar, call that bookmark, you know, my 1200 watt scooter motor. And then any point you wanted to bring up your scooter model and then see how it performs, you know, at different voltages and with different motor controllers, you'd be right there to play with. Um, and it's almost as convenient as having it in this drop down list. It would just be in a bookmark on your uh, toolbar bookmarks. Okay, so that's going to wrap it up for me. So thank you all for uh, those who attended and watched this. Um, as I sort of mentioned in our blog post, the, the goal of doing this every two weeks is not really going to be achievable just given how busy things are this summer. Um, but I really do hope to keep on a three to four week schedule um, and to entertain Bill and my own desires to get this information out there. Uh, the next presentation is going to be all about regenerative braking. Um, and I hope to have not only um, simulation does results like this, but also show in this case a lot of actual um, field results. So we're going to be looking at stuff um, from our trip analyzer um, where we've ridden our bikes around Vancouver, we've gone on touring trips and we've logged all of that data. Um, and then we can show 
not just hypotheticals with regenerative braking, but actual firsthand field experience so that we're not just pulling numbers out of our ass. We can say, you know, this is a typical regen percent. This is what you can expect for this grade hill um, and show you that based on firsthand ride data. So I really do look forward to, to sharing all that knowledge with you guys and uh, have a great solstice and Father's Day, my second Father's Day. I'm going to go <laughs> see my wife and child now. So uh, take care, everybody. I'm going to sign out. And as I said, I'll, uh, anything that was missed, I'll, I'll respond to comments in the YouTube comment here. Bye-bye.